Um, so welcome everybody to our fall information session for the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences. My name is Carter Timmon. I'm the Associate Director of the program. We have a couple other members of our team here, Marco and Megan, and you've already met Chris. Um, we'll do more introductions in a second, but let's get started here. Uh, if my PowerPoint will go, there we go. Uh, so just a quick rundown of the day. We're going to talk a little bit about the program and the team, a little bit about our current curriculum for this academic year. You see I have 22 to 23 there. I'll talk a little bit about our professors um, that we have on campus here, our advisory board, um, and various resources that you could expect as an MBDS student. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll have a Q&A session towards the end. So first of all, what is the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences? Um, so we're primarily interested in social and behavioral change, um, specific tools and mechanisms of behavior change. So we aim to understand the process behind decision making in a variety of environments and different ways to change it. We are evidence based, so we do um, train in different methods and measures to create sustainable change. Uh, students also learn to translate academic research into practical applications. And this entire program is a bit of the brainchild of Christina Bicchieri, and, and it's the first masters of its kind in the US. So who's Christina Bicchieri? Professor Christina Bicchieri is um, our founding director. Uh, she is also the S.J. Patterson Harvey Professor of Social Studies and Comparative Ethics. Um, she's the director of the Philosophy, Politics, and Economics undergrad program, which is also the first of its kind in this country. And she's really a pioneer in uh, norms research, especially uh, applied research. You'll see here on this slide that she's consulted with UNICEF, I think since 2007, on various interventions they have around the world to improve people's lives by altering norms, social norms, moral norms, uh, customs, that sort of thing. She has over 25 years of research and consulting experience and is really a leader in this field. Uh, she's authored more articles than I can imagine. Uh, it says here over 100, and I'm sure it's higher than that now, uh, and has at least seven books. Um, if you're ever interested, you can definitely read more on her Wikipedia. Uh, she's a really brilliant person. So she is one of the special factors of the MBDS program. But what else is special about us is that we're interdisciplinary. So we pull from economics, from judgments and decision-making psychology, from statistics and public policy, network analysis out of sociology, and other bits of, and pieces of fields to create our unique subfield. We have a strong applied side, right? So everything that we do is meant to go back out into the real world and be used in real behavior change situations. Um, we are very hands-on and we do work on industry projects, um, which maybe Marco will talk about at some point. But before we get any farther, let me introduce my colleagues here. I've sort of talked about Christina Vicchieri. She couldn't be with us today, but we do have Marco and Megan. So I'll hand it over to Marco. Yeah, thank you very much, Carter, for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Marco Carrara. I work with a, a master since a couple of years. My experience is, has been managing as executive different companies in different countries. And uh, my main focus is, uh, as my title say, employer partnership. So I develop connection between our industry partners that we call industry affiliates and the students. This is the main focus. Thanks, Carter. Thank you, Marco. Um, I am Megan Wilkins. I am the administrative coordinator for MBDS. I um, am available for uh, your help you know, as a student, and I do a lot of the back end stuff with the, um, you know, the business end of, I guess, the program. Um, and I'm happy to be here to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Um, we also have some amazing instructors. They couldn't be with us today, uh, but I just want to introduce them quickly. You'll get to know them as a student here. Uh, first up, I have Nazla Bhatia. 
She is a senior research fellow in the Department of Psychology, and she's a lecturer at the Wharton School. She teaches our negotiation behavior class, as well as a negotiation behavior class at Wharton. Um, and she teaches a large organizational behavior class here on campus, which is part of the, the core. Um, Dr. Eugen DeMont is another great professor of ours. He's a practice professor in the MBDS uh, and a research fellow. Uh, he teaches our core course 501, which is behavioral science um, theory and experimental methods. And we also have Diego Isenena as a practice professor of, um, who teaches public policy and behavior in 503, and he teaches a game theory course for us. Uh, we also have Zara Khan, Ed, Dr. Ed Roisman, and Dr. Shpanov. Um, they teach a number of classes for us, including a core judgments and decision-making class that you could expect to take, um, statistics courses that you can expect from Alex. Alex also teaches an elective in groups and networks. Uh, and we'll talk about prerequisites soon, but if you do have to take them, he'll teach your intro to statistics prerequisite. Um, Zarek is excellent. He's worked in applied behavioral science in the field for quite a while. Uh, and he consults with us to help structure our capstone experience, which you will all take as well. Okay, I want to make sure our faces aren't in the way. Well, that's not really working. Let's do this. Okay, I don't know why it's just showing me. I don't know if you all see exactly what I see. I'm having trouble with it. All right. Um, so this year's curriculum is a really good example going forward. Every year there could be slight tweaks, but this is what you should expect. This is the backbone of the program. Um, done full time, it is a one year program. It's a total of nine course units. So some schools have transitioned to a course unit type model um, as Penn has. So at other schools, a single course might be say four credits. One course unit at Penn is about the equivalent of four credits at another university. So that's nine classes, or 10 classes total. I'll talk about why it's 10 instead of nine in just a second. Um, you have five course units in your core, and you have four electives that you get to choose. So your core is 501. That's Professor Dumont, who had introduced earlier. That's where you really learn about experimental economics, how to run an experiment, and really the core of current behavioral science practice. Uh, you'll also take an applied unit course. This is where you can choose from three. One of them is Professor Batu's course that I mentioned. Another is uh, Christina Beccieri's course, Norms and Nudges. And the third is behavioral public policy, which was Diego Isenena, if you recall. So each of those courses focus on a different route to applying behavioral science in the real world. Uh, and so you sort of pick the one that fits best with your schedule and your interests. You'll also have to take judgments and decisions as a core course, uh, and you'll take a quantitative unit. So we have um, an intermediate and an advanced version. Both of them, you learn a little bit about how to code in R and do data analysis, something that's very valuable for the job market. Uh, and your fifth core unit is your capstone. So your capstone is actually split into two half credit courses over the academic year, fall to spring. Uh, and the first one is called Consulting with Behavioral Science, and the second is the Design Challenge. Uh, now, before I speak a little bit more about the capstone, I just want to po point out that um, each year uh, after you're accepted, there are placement exams for your quantitative unit and for your methods course. They're very simple. We actually call them placement surveys because they're not something to be fretted about. Uh, and they're just to help guide you into one of these choices. So if you're concerned about what you'll take at this early stage, just know that we are here to help you figure that out and we have mechanisms in place. So a little bit more about the capstone. So in the fall, you learn a lot more about uh, how behavioral science is applied in organizations, why these insights and tools are relevant, and um, what to do out in the job market. 
uh, the capstone is very much a culminating experience, bringing together all that you're learning. So in the fall, you're bringing together a lot of what you're learning in your other courses. And in the spring, we have the design challenge where you finally get to apply that. Now, it's on, the, it's on the next slide, there we go. So in the design challenge, this is a semester long collaboration between student groups and our industry affiliates to solve a real life behavioral problem that the affiliate has. Uh, so this is where you get to showcase your training uh, with the affiliates. This is unique to our program. So it's a really great opportunity. Uh, you get practical experience. You have a, a deliverable for the company. Um, and Marco works very hard on this and he's worked all year really uh, in talking with these companies, helping them refine the question that they bring to us. And so you do get introduced to the companies in the fall. Uh, you choose and then you uh, are placed with the companies in the spring to complete your project. Marco, did I miss anything there that you want to add? No, I think it's a, <clears throat> it's a great presentation. It's a great uh, summary. Um, I want to add for the sake of everyone that our job is to offer a broad range of industry affiliates what i mean with this we want to um, they are approximately 20 companies ranging from financial services consulting services uh, big companies and more boutique companies uh, public policy uh, companies uh, why we do this because our uh, our students are very diverse in their skills and expectation, so we really like to offer a broad range for our students to to choose from. And you will see later from Carter uh, the names that we are working on. So thanks. And if there are more questions, I am available. Thank you, Mark. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so. Right here, as Marco prefaced for you. So here are the, some of the companies that we're working with this year. Um, obviously, as you can see, JP Morgan, uh, Vanguard, the Behavioral Insights team, Deloitte. So Numeristics, we'll, we'll work with small boutique behavioral science consulting firms, and we'll also work with some of the big names. Um, depending on what you want to do with your career and what kinds of questions you want to work on, um, what kind of work you just want to do on a daily basis, uh, we, we try to give you, like Marco said, a broad range of organizations of different size and shape to work with. Uh, we've had many great partners in the past and they may come back. It's just that we only have certain space each year where we can only take so many questions and we actually get too many questions sometimes. So you'll also see some of our other affiliates here. We've worked with Cap One, Spotify, uh, Rare, we even work with the water center here at Penn. Um, and I, I don't know if, if your screen is showing names blocking things, but I'll move it over here. We also work with Ideas42, um, who's a great behavioral science consulting firm at New York, uh, BZ. So this is just an idea of some of the companies that you may work with, uh, depending on who's available and who has a question for us in your year. Okay, now a little bit about our electives. I'm going to move this all the way back. So, almost half of your curriculum, right, four out of those five, are up to you. They are electives that you get to choose. Uh, as your primary advisor, you'll work with me uh, to help pick those electives throughout the year. So, don't be alarmed if choice is, is too much um, for you. Uh, I'm here to help you find electives that will match your career and your interests and also incorporate behavioral science at the same time. So we have multiple electives within the BDS department, within NBDS, um, which our students love and are excellent. Um, but you're also welcome to take uh, electives from anywhere at the university. Uh, now, this university is quite large. It has 12 schools. We are in the largest school, which is the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, but other schools include the Annenberg School for Communication, uh, the Wharton School. And so you can take two electives from any school. Uh, you can, the other two should be within MBDS. Um, now, 
as an example, we have negotiation behavior, just new this upcoming semester, we have behavior change for social impact, um, groups and networks. These are all great elective choices within MBDS. Uh, we do share a pre-approved list, so again, don't worry about this. Um, you have even more options for electives too, so we like to build in flexibility to this program. Uh, you can do an independent research study for one of your electives. This is where you would work with an academic mentor on a project of yours and their choosing for an entire semester. Um, really allows you a lot of freedom to work on a topic if a class is offered in that topic. But sometimes we do have special topic seminars that cover something that you're interested in. There are about 10 students. Uh, and you could take those as well as an elective. So one of the benefits of being here at Penn is that you get Ivy League level resources, right? We have various centers and labs on campus. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. We even have a center right here on the same hallway as us that is run by Christina Vicieri. Um, and you've pro some of you have probably heard of the Behavior Change for Good initiative here or the Wharton Behavioral Lab that are just next door. Uh, I think I saw a question briefly in the chat about career services, which you will have access to here as well. Now, Marco, I don't mean to, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I will say that he's sort of our in-house career services yeah. mentor. Yeah, in fact, I saw the question and it's, it's, it's a great question and the answer Yes, basically, my job specifically is to get in touch with these uh, industry affiliates. And these industry affiliates, um, they always ask me uh, about how to hire the students. And actually, some of them are uh, hired at the end of the design challenge by, by these industry affiliates. On the other side, what I am doing, and I have office hours for this, uh, I have students uh, visiting me and chatting with me, meeting with me, because what I realized is that during the design challenge, the students discover something that they didn't think about this before. So maybe they discover some interest in consulting or maybe discover some interest in technology. And I try to help them, the students, to, to go through this process that is not a, a specific moment, in my opinion. It's it's a it's a path uh, that starts when you start a master, and end when you graduate in in May. So yes, I am I am always available for this type of talk that is very enriching for the students, for the companies, and for myself. Marco, can you talk, I'm sorry, can you talk a little bit about some of the questions? There's a question in the chat about example questions. Sure. Uh, good opportunity. Um, what are the behavioral barriers to foster medication adherence? So medication adherence is uh, the doctor tells you uh, to take the pill for seven days and after five days, you decide that you feel good enough uh, to stop to taking the pills. Uh, what are the behavioral barriers to uh, that are a, a roadblock on switch tech ecosystem? I am an Apple customer. Why you don't move uh, to Android, for example? Uh, how do you measure the trust? Uh, for example, from from a client, he trusts the banker or he trusts the bank, and if the the banker leave the banks what will happen to the uh, to the uh, client we leave the bank or not so uh, a lot of questions about uh, safety how to incentivize positive behavior towards safety uh, on drivers that drive uh, um, high risk products so as you can see all the questions are very practical but they are uh, rooted in behavioral science. So our focus is not uh, changing the hardware or improving the investment in, in hardware. Our focus is always the human aspect uh, in a certain situation. So very broad range of questions, very broad. Absolutely, absolutely, thank you. 
Um, does that sort of address that question, Megan? I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, caught you off guard. All right, and and again, I'll address any lingering questions at the end. I know I, I still have to talk about you know even with just the course curriculum, can you do part time, full time, that that sort of thing. But right now, while we're on this slide, I just want to continue to mention that um, Career Services is even in the same building as us. They're really excellent. So let's say you can't meet with Marco or me who have more behavioral science specific career advice. You have access to this wonderful um, department here on campus and they have access to the entire alumni network of Penn. So um, that's also one of the things you get by being a student here. You get to be on QuakerNet where you can find um, other alumni who may be working in industries you're interested in. Um, Career Services has done great work with Handshake. So there, there are many resources here for you to dive into um, and make use of. If you're interested in research at all, um, our library system is one of the best in the world. We are an R1 institution. So you'll have access to pretty much anything that you could wish to read, um, especially in the behavioral and social sciences. Uh, okay, I think that's enough about this. But continuing, I did mention the center here in the hallway. This is uh, the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. We do work quite closely with them. We've had lots of students um, participate in their studies or volunteers, research assistants to get some experience. They bring in wonderful speakers to campus as well. So there are opportunities to connect there too. Uh, now we also have wonderful faculty affiliated with the program. So they don't necessarily teach a course for us, um, but sometimes they do. And uh, often they like to take our students. They know our students very well. They also advise us on our curriculum to make sure that it's up to date with the most cutting edge behavioral science. Um, some of you probably know Katie Milkman there on the end um, or Damon Santola. They've both gotten popular with some of their books recently and other activities. Um, but we also have, you know, Barb Mellers, who is a, one of the, the founding legends of judgment and decision-making psychology, Dan Hopkins, Allison Buttenheim, all wonderful people on campus. You can see more about them on our website as well as other affiliated faculty with the program if you're interested. We have a pretty extensive advisory board as well. Uh, all of these people are interested in mentoring our students, okay? So they work, I don't wanna block out house in there if you don't mind me going over. They work um, in the real world right now. Uh, they have various jobs, you can see it here on the screen. Um, again, you can read more about them on our website. Uh, and they also keep us in touch with what the working world wants out of our students. So we get advice that way and you get advice that way. Um, and then of course, you could have one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships with them if you do wish to, and you wish to, to reach out with any of them directly. So who are our students? Um, generally, we're about 50-50 international students and US students. Um, it varies from year to year. Uh, we have about 72% female population. Uh, some of our students come with work experience, some come, you know, mid-range, they've had five years or so, um, and some of them come straight from undergrad. Uh, we don't necessarily discriminate in the application process if you don't have work experience, or if you have been out of school for a long time, we're interested in having you here. Um, this program is really intended for all ages and, and levels of experience. Uh, Again, our students come from a multitude of backgrounds, psychology, economics, business. Uh, so I'm also an alum of the program. I was in the second cohort. Uh, if you apply this cycle, you'll be applying for the eighth cohort. Um, we are a young program. And my major was anthropology, right? Which we probably wouldn't expect. Um, so we do take all sorts of students. Uh, so we often get the question, how do our students fare in the job market? And I will say that over 90% of our students are in a full-time position or graduate program. 
um, within about six months of their graduation. Uh, that means they're using their degree almost right out the gate. Uh, we offer some professional development training while you're here on campus. So this is not, it is an academic program, but it has a little bit of extra professional flair to it, where you will get some, some real world training. That's that applied side we talked about. Again, I mentioned our advisory board and alumni mentorship, um, and Career Services does offer their services for life for Penn alumni. So just as some examples so that you can sort of better think about it, um, our alumni have gone into various roles as consultants, analysts, strategy associates, behavioral researchers, user researchers, and they work at all sorts of companies, uh, Morgan Stanley, Google, Microsoft, Deloitte, and then smaller companies like BZ and Heuristics that we had mentioned earlier. You can read some of our alumni stories as well online. Um, here are just some brief examples of recent alumni of the program. Um, I put a link down there at the bottom, which uh, you can jot down or rewatch this video once it's posted online. Uh, and so at that link, you can click all these buttons to read our alumni stories, and I encourage you to do it. Uh, I think that they are very helpful in choosing a grad program because you get to hear about uh, what it's really like. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about admissions process this year. So we do have two deadlines. Uh, we have a priority deadline by December 1st. So if you submit your application by then, we know that you think our program is the one you want to be at. Um, because you've shown that we are a priority for you, we treat you as a priority as well, and we will assess your application as quickly as possible. Uh, typically, you'll hear a message back by the end of January if you submit by the priority deadline. Uh, however, you are certainly welcome to submit by the normal deadline, which is February 1st. Uh, it doesn't change your uh, chances of being admitted if you choose to submit at the February 1st. Um, you know, you don't like lose points for that or anything. Uh, and we'll get your, your decisions out by, I think, late April. Um, so that's, those are sort of the deadlines. The materials that you need are all listed on the website as well. Um, so if you're in this, queue, this, this session today and you haven't read our website, I highly recommend bookmarking our website. It has everything you need to know. But you'll see on there that in admissions, you need your personal statement, you'll need your official transcripts, um, you'll need a resume or a CV, and two letters of recommendation. If you've been in the working world for a while, a letter of rec recommendation from your employer is certainly fine. If you're coming straight out from undergrad, two from faculty is um, very reasonable. We would expect that. Um, we will need some standardized test scores. So if you, if English is not your first language and you did not do an undergraduate degree at an English speaking institution, then we will need a TOEFL or IELTS scores sent to us. Um, also, if your transcript is from an international institution, it must come through Certifile or WES. Uh, you can order these ahead of time, and they will be due December 7th. So because at peak, they can take a couple weeks, um, I highly recommend that you order the transcripts to be sent to us before you submit your final application to us. They come separately, so it's fine. Um, we put them together. Uh, we do have a GRE requirement. Um, if you have not worked more than five years, so if it's been less than five years since your undergraduate um, degree, you will need to submit GRE scores. If you've been working in the professional world for five years or more, you do not need to submit GRE scores, okay? Um, I think that's all I wanna say about admissions at this time. Well, I will add that we consider each application holistically so uh, your GRE score, for example, is not 
the only thing we look at. We don't cut people off because of a certain GRE score. Uh, so don't fret about that. Just get the entire package into us. We don't want to see something missing. And so that we can uh, assess you as an entire package, OK? Um, also, what's not on this slide, please note that we do have a minimum 3.0 GPA requirement. Now, I, I think I mentioned briefly that we do have some prerequisites in the program. Uh, we assess whether or not you need these based on your transcripts once you submit. So you can take either of these or both of these in undergraduate. You won't have to take them here. But uh, if you don't have a statistics course or a microeconomics or game theory course, either microeconomics or game theory will count for this category, then you will need to take those before you get here. We will not reject your application simply because you haven't taken them, OK? Uh, if you're getting your degree in art or something like that and you want to come to our master and you're a good fit, but you don't have these background courses, we won't reject you just on the, that alone, OK? Um, we will notify you of whether or not you need prerequisites in your um, decision letter. So uh, there's no need to, to query the program or send us a question about whether or not a course you have will already count. So what we're looking for, if you are scheduling your courses right now in undergrad, what we're looking for is a statistics course, an introduction to st statistics, or a microeconomics or game theory course. Well, and sorry, a microeconomics and game theory course. OK? Um, these are various ways that you could stay in touch with us. We're coming to the end of the presentation at the Q&A section. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. We probably don't post that very often. Uh, we're most active on LinkedIn, so that's a good way to get in touch with us. And of course, please write down our email. It's penmbds at sas.upenn.edu. And thank you very much for listening to me talk for like 30 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I see we have at least 30 questions and answers. Questions. I answers. need a couple of notes if you want me to kind of go over and you can answer them live. Um, okay, great. Uh, can we take more than one, uh, more than nine courses? Um, and obviously that would take longer and cost more. But... Yes, you can take more than nine courses while you're here. Um, they won't count towards your degree. Uh, and you just take them as electives on the side. They, and LPS students, which our students are, um, pay per course unit. So you'll just pay the extra fee for the extra course. That's how that works. There's another one asking about grants and scholarships. So unfortunately, the program doesn't offer any scholarships at this time. There are federal grants available to US students. Um, and various scholarships available through other organizations, and I encourage you to research those and apply for them. There is a question about the BCBA exam, the Behavioral Anal uh, Analyst Certificate Board. I don't know about that in particular. I do know that um, one that that sometimes. Uh, Psychologists who work on behavioral therapy have to take certain trainings um, that will come up if you Google search behavioral science trainings or certificates or that sort of thing. So I would uh, just encourage you to make sure that it's that um, or not that, uh, because our program is not a clinical psychology degree. It is much more focused in the realm of behavioral economics rather than uh, clinical psychological training for behavior change. Does that make sense? I have another one that's a four part question. So maybe we can just go rapid fire. Um, okay. What has been the average age of the program in the last three years? I do not have that statistic off the top of my head. Okay. I would say it's probably about 25. Uh, the second question is, uh, are there campus placements for jobs once the program is over? I'm not sure what that means campus placements. I think we usually um, get them, you know, work with them to get outside placements. I don't know 
Yeah, there are a few few of our students that have gotten campus placements. Well, <clears throat> maybe, Megan, maybe I can try to answer to this question in, in this way. Our industry affiliates during the fall semester and spring semester, they are exposed to our students, our students to our industry affiliates. And so at the end, the process of uh, hiring uh, is, is it, it really, it's fluid and is not controlled by, by us. What I can tell everyone, that a good number of uh, students are hired by our industry affiliates. Yes. Uh, the next part of that question is, uh, I did not graduate with a psychology degree in college, but I have 10 years of work experience in digital marketing. Is there a must have eligibility criterion? So I think I've gone over this actually in the admissions section. Um, I mean, if if you have an art degree, for example, and you could still be a great candidate if you have good work experience uh, and that sort of thing. So um, no, you're not disqualified because you don't have a psychology degree. So that kind of gets into the fourth part of the question. Uh, tell me a bit about career scope routes for graduates, especially in creative industries. So just a second. I thought I saw Marco had a comment. Yeah, it was it was an interesting point. A lot of our questions, uh, some of our questions are in the marketing uh, domain and user experience. So there are, uh, as you said, Carter, uh, different background uh, in, uh, with degree in, in, in art. They really enjoy on liberal studies. They really enjoy and bring value to our court and to the industry affiliates. Absolutely. So I think that answers another question that I saw in there briefly. Sorry, Megan, if this is throwing things off, but somebody asked if coming from a biology background, are we looking for a diverse uh, background of the cohort? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what makes the program strong is if we have a diverse cohort. Biology background, yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of healthcare companies that we work with, mm -hmm. uh, always related to behavioral. Absolutely. And if you think of behavior, I mean, it's biopsychosocial at minimum, right? So there is a biological component to behavior. Um, that would be a very interesting avenue to explore. Uh, okay, next question, Megan. They're flooding in, I see. Yeah, they are. So I think you already talked about the GRE school requirements. That was the next one. I did, yeah. And there's no no necessary minimum. Uh, market. I have market research experience with psychology background and thinking about expanding my knowledge and data for business strategy. Do you have a course guideline if I want to master in specific domain, specific, especially an elective part? Sure, yeah. And so that's such a specific question that we... Um, if you have similar questions to that, we'll talk about it uh, after the admissions process. Um, but it's certainly something that I work with a lot of students on. So um, one of the benefits of having a large option of electives is that you really can tailor the program into something that matches your interests and what you want to do. Uh, and I help you with that. So if you're trying to go into data, um, analytics for business strategy. That's something that we can definitely talk about how to get your electives so that you're well positioned for that um, within, you know, paired with our behavioral science core. Um, there was another question here are, uh, about the schedule. So another question earlier that I answered um, by typing asked, you know, when the classes typically happen. And I said, you know, we try and shoot for the evenings because we have a lot of working. Okay. And then there's another one that says, would the entire program be, it would be possible to complete the entire program being on campus one or two days per week. And I know we ah, typically okay. do full-time, so you can talk about okay. that. So let me talk about that and, and about full and part-time a little bit. So we always have part-time students. Um, our program is designed to be flexible, right? And uh, now you are encouraged to take the program full-time and complete it in one calendar, one academic year, sorry, which is only two terms. That's like really fast for a master's degree. Um, however, you're certainly welcome to do it part-time. You have a maximum of four years to complete the degree. However, part-time, our students finish it in two years typically. Uh, so that's that looks like two classes per semester, um, two and a half in your second year because of the capstone. 
And we schedule all of our courses um, with this in mind. So we try to schedule a lot of our courses in the 5.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. block of time uh, so that students who work full time can, can get over here to campus and do the, the class. Uh, if a course is offered both semesters, like it's offered in fall and spring, um, we try to make sure that at least one of those semesters is offered in the evening block so that our part-time students can take it. Um, I will also mention here that our, our degree is entirely on-site. It, it does require you to be on campus and we don't have remote options for class. If I can add something, Carter, yes. to this clear explanation is just this. Of course, we are very flexible. Uh, usually our uh, part-time students takes in two years. The only requirement is for the capstone course, which is the culmination of what you are learning. Uh, and this needs to be taken in the second year. So because it's always the same logic, you build your skills, we help you building the skills, then you apply the skills. That's that's the only that's the only point to be taken into consideration. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Marco. I forgot that. That's a really good point. Um, also, if you start full time and something happens in your life and you have to go part time, we work with you on that. OK. There are a couple of questions here that say, um, what is the breakdown of how many people are uh, full time students um, working full time and how feasible is it to manage both? Uh, and there are several questions asking that thing. same thing. Sure. Um, so uh, again, I don't have the statistic right off the top of my head. I'd say probably 70 or 80% of our students are full-time. Um, the ones who are part-time, it varies depending on what kind of job they're doing. They all do different kinds of jobs. Some of them work nine to five. Some of them work odd hours. Some of them work you know, remotely and some are on site for their job. So their levels of workload all vary. Some of them are able and willing to take three credits a term, and some of them have to do, you know, two, and sometimes I do one. Um, so it's definitely feasible. Um, as with any time that you do sort of night school, uh, it's difficult because you have to work full time and then go do school part time. So you're like by definition doing one and a half things rather than one thing. Uh, but that is really not something that I can advise generally about. I'd have to speak with you one-on-one -on -one to find the best schedule for you. A couple questions here about the GRE. Is it an absolute requirement for applicants recently graduated from undergrad? And is the five-year date, um, so is it five years from the date we submit our application or is it by the start of the program? Um, it is a requirement for anybody with under five years. And I believe it's five years since your graduation date, not since the application date. Uh, another one is, uh, are interviews part of the standard admissions process? Um, we, we will be having some interviews this year. Uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly how they will happen just yet. Back to so if you get invited, uh, will tell you what you need to prepare for that. Okay. Uh, back to the GRE question. They're um, asking um, if they've worked in different industries, such as digital, digital marketing. It's just having a job and being in the working um, world for five years is, is the um, answer to that. Yes. Yeah. So we're, it, it's more of a time requirement. Um, whether you're a Starbucks barista for three years and a digital marketer for two years, is that's totally fine, right? That's still five years, okay? Um, this person says, I did not understand the part you mentioned about the the West WES score uh, being sent separately before or after the deadline. Oh, okay, that's important to go over. So if um, if you are an international student or you, you, your degree is from an international school, not a US school, uh, you must have your transcript sent to us through one of those two organizations, WES, WES, or Certifile. Um, again, this information is available on the website. Uh, 
you can go to those organizations and what they do is essentially translate your transcript into an American transcript. Um, and they send us a copy of that translation with the original transcript. Uh, this process can take a couple weeks at peak admissions time. So uh, I suggest that you do it um, before the December 1st deadline. If you're applying for December 1st, go to the Certifile or West websites, you can find them through Google and have them send your transcript to us uh, before that December 1st deadline so that it gets to us in time. It, does, okay. it doesn't have to get to us by December 1st, at least by December 7th though. That's the transcript deadline. Someone asks if the December deadline is binding. I don't know what that means. The answer is no. <laughs> like, did they, yeah, like, did, are they um, obligated to comment once they've gotten? Megan, excuse me, Megan. I wanted to answer, uh, so while you look at the others, about the question from uh, David, I think, uh, that addressed me, Signor Marco Carrara. Thank you so much for the Signor Marco Carrara. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, here in the US, uh, it's, it's, it's Marco, but I appreciate this. Uh, and your question is quite interesting. And I think it, my answer is this one uh, for you and for everyone. You gain, there are two types of industry affiliates. So I told you there are different industries, but there are two main types. One that submit a question that are working in this moment. So they need the, the answer right now, right in spring 2024. Other group, they have questions about some future trends. So just listening to the presentations in person from the industry affiliates, what you gain is perspective of where the, the trends are going. When you listen, uh, Deloitte, Ernst Young, and Ipsos talking about something, you have an idea of where the, the, the industry is going. When you listen to the World, uh, uh, World Bank, uh, it's a question related to now. So you gain working on the question, but also on thinking and reflecting on, on the question before to choose. I hope I answered your, your question. There are people that ask about certifiable evaluation, pro certifiable evaluation process for international students. Um, so this is what I talked about with the transcripts. I want to go back to the so that's been answered. I want to go back to the binding one. Um, I think I know what you mean now. Uh, do you mean if, questioner, you mean that uh, sending your priority uh, application means that we, you must come here? Uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, the priority application is to signal to us that we're your top program. So do not submit at the priority if we're not your top program. Uh, that way, when we're looking at your application, we know that you really want to come here. Um, obviously, we should think that you really want to come here no matter when you submit your application. Um, but that priority deadline is just another way for you to signal to us where we are on your list. Um, and that helps us make our decision. And there's a question about uh, what the course exams and grading system looks like. So all of our courses are standard letter grade. Uh, the professors have discretion to teach how they teach and assign different kinds of final assignments, but none of our courses are pass-fail. That's about as far as I can explain generally. Uh, is there room in our application for supplemental information? Um, it depends on what one means by supplemental information. We have a lot of, we have standardized which documents you give to us, and I've seen some other questions in here about um, uh, uh, what to put in the personal statement. So I will say that the personal statement is probably where you are most flexible to add any information that you think the application system would miss otherwise, right? So if there's something that you think is not captured in the other documents required and other scores required, your personal statement is really the place to talk about it. Um, your personal statement is the only opportunity you get to speak with us, really, in your own voice. Um, that's unique to you. 
So I encourage you to use that space to speak professionally and well about why you're fit for this program, why you want to be here and that sort of thing. I hope that answers your question. Um, there's another question here about the neuroscience certificate. Um, were the, are the requirements for the application if the student is interested in the neuroscience, neuroscience certificate? Also, does taking the neuroscience certificate mean that the student will, wouldn't be able to choose other electives? The second part is correct, that a student's electives would all have to go towards the certificate, unless, of course, they do what we talked about earlier and take more than nine CUs at their own cost. Uh, I'm not sure what the other part of the question is. We only have five more minutes, so I want to sort of make sure that we're getting some of the major questions. Uh, is there one theme that's really popping out at you, Megan? I'm kind of going through them as I see them. OK, so. let me look through it really quickly. I'm, I'm sorry if I haven't gotten to your question yet today. Um, again, please browse our website. Some of these may be answered on there. Um, some other questions are more general and I can't answer, like what is a 3.0 GPA equivalent in the UK? That is something that's easily Googleable, um, but that I, I don't have offhand. Marco, you want to add something? Yeah, because of course, um, I, as you can see, uh, Carter, Megan, and myself, we, we manage different parts of the master. So all the, let me say, technical question is, is Carter. I was thinking about his explanation about the personal statement. We really, I really encourage you if you have interest in behavioral science to make it make it clear in your statement, because what I am learning is that behavioral science is good across many, many, many fields in in industry, in education. Uh, in recycling, uh, in energy saving, ESG. So really, uh, we like to have this diversity background, and the outcome, and the outcome of, of our students is in consulting, or is in companies, or is at UNICEF, so uh, an NGO. So if you if you have interest in marketing, if you have interest on data science. Um, write it down and, 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 and not think that we will not take into serious consideration because also because our industry affiliates they like in the group of four people five that work on their question to have diversity and i experimented and i saw that our students in a group of five that are more interested on data management uh, they're in designing a survey other uh, in uh, uh, site visit to get interviews. So really different background are always welcome. Sorry, uh, Carl, that was a wrap up for me. No, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, no notes. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so Megan, I've been looking through some of these questions and I have like, I've seen a couple that I can sort of, I think, synthesize an answer to. And I think that that should be our final for the day. Um, We've answered some of these other ones. I know something just popped up and it moved my screen. Give me a second here. So part of my answer for this comes from a question from Liza, I think is, it, is the name, um, who's asked as a grad of the program, talking to me, can you talk a bit about the best parts of the program, areas for opportunity, that sort of thing. And I've also seen some questions about, you know, if it's one year instead of two year, how is it regarded publicly? And uh, is this good if you're going to a PhD, that sort of thing. So I will say I'm a little bit academically oriented, uh, so I can relate to the desire to go into a PhD. Um, and I will say that the students who want to do a PhD in this program are, um, we always have a few every year and they're always successful. I've never heard of one who isn't successful. Um, the one from last year is, is going on to a Harvard pre-doc program this year. Um, so, I mean, yes, it's a one-year program, but remember that it is at Penn and it's a high quality program. Uh, we are rigorous. Uh, it, we will train you to both conduct research in an academic setting 
and in real life setting and to apply insights from that research. And so I think that's one of, to go back to Liza's question, one of the strengths of the program is that we are um, much more rigorous than say an MBA. Um, we, our students can come out and work as scientists, um, but they can also work as consultants in a company, right? Like an MBA could. So we provide students with sort of a diverse set of opportunities. Um, and I think that that mostly answers the question. Areas of opportunity, like opportunity for growth and change. I'm not quite sure yet. You'll have to come to my office and ask me. And I'm sure Marco and I can have plenty of discussions with you about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you can reach me anytime, uh, everyone. So thank you all for coming. I'm sorry if I didn't get your question. Um, I see that there are so many of them, but also many answered. Um, I, I Quick note, I would recommend that you do send your GRE scores earlier rather than later. Again, we put it together with the application. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for coming and providing such great questions. Anything else from, from the team? Thank you, Carter. A very clear presentation, and I, I hope you will will all consider to uh, apply at a pen at at our master. Yeah. Thank you all for attending. Hope to see you. Absolutely. Hope to read your applications. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.